Let me begin by saying hello to everyone. My name is Brian Knight and this is Tell a Friend. I also want to acknowledge and apologize for my long absence. It's been a busy few days, weeks, months, exam season. You know how it gets down. But I'm back today with a very special episode of Tell a Friend. In the past few weeks, I had the pleasure of interviewing Ramin Satuda about his recently released New York best-selling book, Ladies Who Punch. Satuda is an award-winning journalist and the New York Bureau Chief of Variety. His book, Ladies Who Punch, reports on the talk show, The View. For those of you who don't know, The View is a talk show in America that was created and produced by broadcasting titans Barbara Waters and Bill Getty in 1997. It has been on air for over two decades, 22 seasons to be exact. The show features a panel of women from different professions giving their analysis of politics and current affairs during a segment famously known as Hot Topics. The panelists have included many influential women over the years, including Whoopi Goldberg, Rosie O'Donnell, Meghan McCain, and of course, Barbara Waters herself. So Tudor's book has been the subject of many headlines due to its revelations about the show's operations on and off camera. With the view being titled The Most Important Political TV Show in America This Week by the New York Times, it felt appropriate to share this interview with all of you. There were some minor recording difficulties during the recording of this interview, but this should not take away from the essence of the interview. And I hope you enjoy it. Have a listen. Thank you so much for um, wanting to talk to me, and thank you so much for enjoying my book. Yes, it was amazing. So I'll start by asking you about the process of writing the book. Did you have any worries about the access you'd have prior to pitching the book? So I've written about The View for about um, 10 years now as an as a entertainment journalist, um, both at Newsweek and at Variety. Um, I knew that in order to make this book successful, it would have to be a deeply reported book, and they would have to have interviews with almost everyone on the show. Um, and it was a really lengthy process. It took me three years to get you know, all the interviews that I needed. Um, but of course, it's always, you know, in the process, as you're waiting for the interviews, it, it can be, you know, a daunting thing because, you know, I needed to talk to as many of the co-hosts as I could. Um, but once I talked to Barbara Walters, Rosie O'Donnell, and um, Star Jones, I think I felt really confident that I had, you know, the narrative was coming together. And then as more co-hosts agreed to talk to me, it just, the story just sort of was very, very clear. Um, and I knew that, you know, I could pull it off as more co-hosts agreed to talk to me. So what was your main intention for writing the book? I mean, why The View? I think The View is a really, really influential TV show that um, often doesn't get credit for all that it's changed in our culture. And I really, um, whenever I've written about it, there's been a lot of interest in the show. Um, and I wanted to do it about The View because I wanted to show and examine and explore all the things that The View changed in television. Okay, so who took the most convincing to interview? It took me um, an, over a year to, to get Rosa Donald to talk to me. Um, uh, we were, I was on the sort of, it was in the middle of the process. And then, you know, I thought maybe she was going to talk to me after the election, and then Donald Trump became the president, and we all expected Hillary to be the president, but Donald Trump became the president, and she stopped doing press and, you know, had a really hard time with that, understandably so. Um, uh, so Ro Rosie was a lengthy process and required lots of emails and waiting, and um, it took some time to get Rosie to agree to talk to me, and also Star Jones took some time to get her to agree to talk, talk to me, too. Would you say they took a long time to agree because of their departures from the show? I think that um, for Star, I think she didn't necessarily want to revisit everything that she'd been through on that show. And then when she heard all the other people that I'd interviewed and I saw her um, at an event and talked to her, I think that convinced her that, you know, this was a work of journalism and I really needed her voice in it. So you mentioned the election of Trump. I think one thing that stood out for me in the book with the way that we watch the history of The View, but with this um, dual narrative of the Hillary and Trump aspect of it. And in the book, you even describe Hillary Clinton as the Phantom Six host. In what way would you say Clinton reflects or reflected both the host and the viewers? So my original thesis when I sold this book, because I sold it before the election, was that um, The View predicted a society in which voters would elect the first female president. I really thought that sort of this show 
would foreshadow a culture in which Americans would finally elect the first female president, and that would be Hillary Clinton. And I was actually at the show on the night of the election because they were doing a primetime special where all the co-hosts were getting ready to celebrate Hillary's victory. Um, I think she was incredibly important to the show because Hillary Clinton was this symbol in which the women saw themselves. She was a career woman. She was someone who had um, career ambitions on her own. She was outspoken. She would get criticized. And I think a lot of women in Hollywood related to Hillary Clinton because to be in the public spotlight and to have, you know, all this extra criticism because of your gender was something I think a lot of the co-hosts could relate to. And also most of the co-hosts on the show were liberal. And so they did see Hillary Clinton as a, as a hero and someone that they rooted for. Her narrative was, you know, part of the view from the very, you know, very beginning of the show, starting from her life as a first lady, the um, Monica Lewinsky affair, to running um, for the Senate, you know, running in 2008 and almost being the nominee and not winning, and then, you know, being Secretary of State and then running again in 2016. So the show has very closely followed her career trajectory and her life. Well, talking about career ambitions, we do see a lot of power struggles uh, throughout the book. And one thing that stood out was Barbara Walters' passive power. Uh, for example, her ousting of hosts and also getting Elizabeth's job at Fox News um, through her friendship with Roger Ailes. Would you describe Barbara Walters' time on the show as one of hostility, jealousy, and feeling threatened by newcomers? No, I wouldn't. I think that she, I think that she was actually... I think Barbara Walters was open to having a platform where she would find talent and also sort of propel the talent because it was supposed to be an ensemble show and she was she wanted every woman on that show to succeed because it reflected on her it was her show she was executive producer she was she owned half of the stake i think what happened was there were situations in which the personalities became sort of larger than she anticipated and then there were these you know rivalries that she didn't expect or anticipate but i don't think that she in creating the view wanted it to be a ground for you know um you know hostile egos or like clashes in the way that it became i think star jones was really the first one to enter the uh, enter stardom uh, from the panel except barbara how would you say Joy avoided being caught up in all the drama in the 22 seasons that she's been on the show? I think that Joy, um, it became very clear early on that Joy wasn't going to be competitive with Barbara and that Joy wasn't going to try to, you know, overshadow Barbara or take the show away from Barbara. Joy was content being the comedian on the show and being funny on the show and having her punchlines. And she wasn't, she's not really necessarily a competitive you know, person career-wise in the way that Barbara is. And so I think that she she sort of carved out her own path on the show, and there wasn't really a lot of overlap between her and Barbara. But you're right, Star tells me in the book that she became larger than life. And it started to feel like the Star Jones show, especially when she was um, using the show as a platform to promote her 2004 wedding and doing segments about her wedding and talking about her wedding. And the other co-hosts really resented that. Throughout the book, you perfectly captured all of the hosts um, and their arc of transformation. We see it with Barbara Walters. We also see it with Star. Which of the hosts that you interviewed seemed most reflective about their time on The View? I think that the reason this book works is that almost every host that I interviewed was open and honest about their experience and also sort of reflected, in some cases, on the mistakes they may have made or the struggles that they had on the show. But I do think that... um, it was interesting talking to Star because Star was very reflective of, of her time on the show. And she talked very openly about struggling with her um, weight and getting a gastric bypass surgery um, and being fearful of telling the public that she had had the procedure because she was scared that it wouldn't work. And as a result of that, she would be um, made fun of. And so that was a very vulnerable thing for her to talk about, and I don't think she'd ever really talked about it in that way. Um, But to hear her explanation, because for years, as viewers, we would see her on the show and she wouldn't talk about, you know, having a gastric bypass, and she said there had been a medical intervention, but she, there were all these stories about how she wanted to hide it and she didn't want to tell the public. But hearing from her own mouth, like, what she went through, I thought was a really, um, it, it made her very vulnerable, and hearing her side of the story, I think, added sort of dimension to the show and added uh, sort of dimension to what was happening behind the scenes of the show. I completely agree. She almost redeemed herself uh, throughout the book when she talks about 
uh, recognizing that she did have a big ego at the time and how uh, she was brought down to earth by everything that happened with the wedding. She was, I think, the most reflective um, of all the co-hosts and the most aware of what had happened on that show and how it had changed people's perception of her. And I think something you do really well in this book is you show all of the hosts as being multi-dimensional characters, which is why it's really hard, I think, to say someone came out looking the worst or someone came out looking the best. You really did a good job of showing the complexity of all the characters. Oh, thank you, Ryan. I was really, I mean, it was really important for me writing this book that all the women would be multi-dimensional, and even though some of the women had flaws, I didn't want anyone to come across, you know, as, as good or bad. It was important for me to show all the layers and depths of these women and what they experienced on the show, and also what it was, what it's like to, you know, be famous and be a woman in Hollywood and try to sort of have your own platform and your own vehicle and the struggles that you, you know, have to undergo and how they're different often than, you know, what men experience in the entertainment industry. Now, talking about struggles, let's move on to talking about departures from the show. On page 179, you write, Rosie was hurt that the show had moved on without her. And she goes on to say she felt like Lord Voldemort, whose name shall not be spoken, and then she went on to talk about her being cropped out of uh, photos. This is a reoccurring theme that I noticed with star Rosie and Barbara. They all tried to, accept Barbara, underplay their love of the show, and once it they left the show, they almost tried to deny the show giving them a platform or maintaining their platform. But in reality, we do see them going through this mourning process as they leave the show. I think that the show is a really big and important platform. And to be a co-host of The View is a very big deal here in the United States of America. And it is a big deal on daytime television because um, it really gives you such visibility every single morning to go on television and express your points of view and tell people what you think. Um, I think that I think that Star certainly loved being on The View. I think that Rosie had a very difficult and conflicted relationship with the show. Um, I think she enjoyed the platform and she enjoyed having a place where she could talk about George W. Bush's policies for an audience of stay-at-home moms. And these were important political discussions that no one was having anywhere else on television. But I also do think that she was very hurt that when she left the show, that she didn't receive her the due credit for changing the DNA of The View and making it a very political show. Because the show, when it started, wasn't as political. And in season 10 in 2006, when Rosie Donald came on board, she did make the show very political and very passionate. And I think that propelled The View into its second act, into the Whoopi Goldberg years. And Rosie felt like they, she didn't, she wasn't getting the due credit. As the show was succeeding, you know, with Whoopi in the Obama years, Rosie felt like she had been sort of replaced and that the show was trying to erase the fact that she'd ever been there. Which is interesting because uh, Whoopi, well, from what I've read, she doesn't seem like she was interested about hijacking the show. She just wanted to be a passenger of the show. Yes, very much. Whoopi was only interested in, in coming in, doing her job, and leaving. She had no interest in being the producer or changing the, the show dramatically. Um, but I think that um, we see sort of the tensions and the different personalities play out in 2014 when Rosie returns to view and would be the moderator. If I'm honest, as a fan of the show, when I heard Rosie was coming back, I knew that there was going to be trouble there. I kind of sensed it with these two big characters. Well, a lot of the producers were very, um, were puzzled about how it would work because Rosie was used to calling all the shots and Whoopi isn't someone who wanted to be produced by Rosie. So there was immediate conflict that season. Would you say Rosie struggled between knowing whether she wanted to be an EP on the show or whether she actually wanted to be a host because she was um, wanting to control a lot of the shots, wanting to control um, just a lot of the technical elements of the talk show? that I think there was a bit of tension there from what I read. Yes, but I don't think she... I think that that is the way she is used to being on a talk show because she was on her 90s talk show and she was so successful for so long, you know, as a talk show host. But she's very hands-on. A lot of... Most on-air talent will defer to producers or will just come to work and let, you know, the team take things over. But Rosie had always been very involved in the actual producing of her... 90s talk show and she wanted to be involved in the producing of the view as well 
it's not that she wanted to only produce it, but she wanted to produce it and be on it. Now, talking about the TV industry, in the book you detail a lot of the fights that were occurring behind the scenes with executives and producers, mainly male. Would you say the media has been sexist over the years in its characterization of the female hosts? I think that there definitely has been sexism when it comes to The View, and also there's been sexism when it's come when it comes to the sort of the portrayal of the you know the show. I don't think it's gotten its due credit. I don't think people you know take it as seriously as it deserves to be taken. I think that it really has changed television in a lot of different ways. Barbara Walters talked to me about you know different kinds of sexism that she experienced throughout her career, starting with when she was um, hired to be the co-host of the Evening News in 1976. Newspapers were writing stories about her, snarky stories about her owning a pink typewriter and how, you know, they weren't, the men on the crew wouldn't say hi to her or be nice to her because they were, they felt like she had done this great disservice to the male anchor that she joined on the Evening News. Um, and I think we also see sexism when Barbara tries to launch the view and people thinking that, you know, this isn't really a worthy endeavor for her or that somehow by her going on daytime television, it would tarnish her reputation. And I'm not sure that a male broadcaster of her stature would be experiencing the same kinds of questions if he had decided to spin out something different. Um, you know, so I do think that there is a double standard, and certainly this book does explore some of the ways in which women are treated differently than men. I completely agree. Another thing the, that uh, struck me was the um, tokenist nature of the TV industry, especially when it comes to the hiring of Sherry and Whoopi at the same time. Did this surprise you? Yes, yeah, so one of the interesting... Um, one of the interesting things I learned in the book was that when Bill Getty, the executive producer, wanted to hire both Sherry Shepard and Whoopi Goldberg the same year, there was some pushback from the network. And there was this idea that the view only needed um, one African-American woman at the table, which is a ridiculous idea. And Bill was intent to show that even though Whoopi and Sherry, you know, they were both needed on the show. There's no, there, there was no reason to only cast one African-American co-host. There could be two African-American co-hosts at the same time. And he really thinks that that led to the resurgence of you know, popularity in the show during the Obama years, having Whoopi and Sherry, who are completely different co-hosts, on the panel with Barbara, with Joy, and Elizabeth. That was, I think, one of the most popular panels The View ever had. But it does sort of, the book does sort of open this, you know, window into like how some of these decisions are made and how um, you know there is this tokenistic um, prejudice in the TV business because a lot of the decisions are being made by white men. I completely agree. Now recently on MSNBC you described the view as a as being a barometer of national moods and you also said that it was an indication of what women believed or thought. Nowadays with Twitter and with the format of CNN, in what way would you say The View was ahead of its time? I think that The View is um, ahead of its time in a lot of ways, but particularly in the idea that news and opinion could coexist, and the idea that opinion was just as important as news. So we live in a world now where people's take on the news is often seen as significant as news events themselves, and I think The View really sort of caught on to that early on. It wasn't just that the show was covering the Lewinsky scandal. It was offering different co-hosts with different takes on the scandal, whether it be, you know, supporting the president or supporting Monica Lewinsky or making jokes or having, like, they each had a very clear way of looking at what was happening in the news, and I think it kind of predicted where we're at right now. What would you say uh, has been the biggest contribution The View has made to the industry and society at large? I think that the view has um, the view has done a, 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 several things here in the United States. One is it has placed a premium on opinion and showed that opinion can be as important as news on television. And it changed, I think, a lot of viewing habits. Right now, when you turn on CNN in the United States, what you see is essentially what you see on the View, which is you know pundits talking about the news, but also interjecting their opinion. And I think The View made it safe for people to express their opinions on TV. Um, it also sort of launched a number of 
you know, careerist here in the United States, everyone from Meredith Vieira, who went on to host the Today Show, to Star Jones, Sherry Shepard, um, Rosie O'Donnell had a second act on daytime television and a third act, and it gave Whoopi Goldberg this additional act in her career. At, you know, after winning the EGOT, she was given this platform to be on daily television interacting with audiences. One thing that I've noticed from watching the show is it almost seems as if Whoopi is sometimes sometimes regrets being on the show because she does allude to wanting to do more acting roles and um, she has spoken before about The View almost putting her in a box of what she can do as an actor. I think Whoopi has a complicated relationship with the show. Um, She wants to be seen as more than just a co-host of The View. She has accomplished so much over her life and her career that she doesn't want to be put in just the, the box of being a talk show host. But I also think that she is responsible for the show's prosperity certainly over the last 10 years and having her on the show was a, is a huge deal for the for the network now i'll move on to talking about the legacy of the show so obviously we have whoopi at the head of the table now do you think any of the previous hosts um except rosie could successfully make a comeback oh i think if meredith Vieira were to ever come back it would be interesting and i think that audiences would be excited about that what does the view represent to you as an author? I think that it's a truly groundbreaking show that created a forum for women to talk about their points of view and to really express how they felt about the world, whether it be pop culture or politics. What's your next venture? What what now for you? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, the show always ends with take a little time to enjoy the view, and I'm hoping to do that. I think that this was a really big undertaking, and I'm really, really excited that everyone is enjoying the book so much and that it's being really embraced by the um, literary community, and I think I'm just going to take a little time to sort of think, figure out my next project. But um, I'm just really, like, I'm getting messages on Twitter, and there's been a lot of really um, great feedback, and I'm just really excited about all that. I'm happy to conclude it here. Thank you very much, Brian. Having read Ramin Satuta's book, I can only continue to recommend it to everyone. The book ambitiously covered the show's evolution from its conception to the present day. Now, whether you're entering the book as a longtime viewer, like myself, or simply a stranger to the show, Ladies Who Punch is a highly informative and entertaining look into the operations involved in producing a daily talk show as well as the TV industry at large. Remember that you can watch daily episodes of The View on their official YouTube page. Remember that you can watch daily episodes of The View on their official YouTube page, and also be sure to check out the Exposé website to read my full review of Satuda's book. That's Exposé spelled E-X-E-P-O-S-E. That's all for today's episode, and in the words of Whoopi Goldberg, take a little time to enjoy The View. (laughs) 